So, salam alaikum. Let's talk about and finish the, uh, the, the final part of the genetic disorder uh, lecture. We'll talk about multifactorial and complex traits in here. So the idea here is that some genetic disorders can be caused by multiple genes or let's say multiple factors. They can be caused by multiple genes and these are known as polygenic traits. Okay, so if we're talking about a condition that is caused by few number of genes, then we call it oligogenic traits. So poly is, uh, it indicates larger number than oligo in this case. If you have an involvement of a non-genetic factor, such as the environment, then we call this trait or we call this condition a multifactorial uh, uh, inheritance. Okay. Now, the idea here is that it's different than autosomal dominant uh, inheritance or recessive inheritance in that we're not talking about a single mutation or mutation in one gene that causes a phenotype. Rather, what happens here is that you have genetic variation, okay, and not necessarily mutation, it's genetic variation that predisposes an individual for a certain condition or a certain disease. So the idea here is that such variation would make the person susceptible to have that condition or that um, disease, okay? So in that case, we would assume if there is a genetic component to that trait or that condition or that disease, uh, we would then assume as well that identical twins would have a higher chance of being affected by a certain condition if one of them is also affected by that condition. So we would assume that if one is, is affected, we would assume that, the, that there is a good chance that the second uh, sibling uh, twin would also be affected. Okay. Now, let's talk about one of these genes or one of these conditions. Here we're talking about breast cancer. In 1990s, in the 1990s, a, a gene known as BRCA1 was identified to be associated with breast cancer. Okay, and true, uh, if a person has a mutation or a variant, a genetic variant in BRCA1, uh, the female would be predisposed to have a to have breast cancer. Okay, and you can see in this pedigree, for example, right here, this female right here has mutation in BRCA1 and uh, she has breast cancer. Now she has a number of daughters. Notice here that this daughter right here uh, is affected by ovarian cancer, not breast cancer. This daughter has um, breast cancer, okay? This daughter is a carrier, okay? You look at this son, this son is a, uh, is a, has the uh, variant, the BRCA1 variant, but does not have breast cancer or any, any, any type of cancer. Now, this brother is married, or this son, or this boy is married to this female, and they have normal female, and they have an affected female. So this female has, or she has inherited the uh, mutated uh, BRCA1 from her father. Now, look at this um, uh, female in here. She's a carrier. Now, her daughter is affected by breast cancer. Um, and, and her son is, uh, is, is, is a carrier or has, um, well, is a carrier but does not have any type of cancer, okay? So the idea here is that you have a lot of variation in here. It doesn't mean that if, if a female has the BRCA1, the mutant uh, or mutated BRCA1, it doesn't mean that she would have breast cancer or she would develop breast cancer. Okay, so this is what we mean by polygenic or multifactorial because you have other factors that are important as well. Okay, so the idea here is that if you look at, for example, Mendelian inheritance, you would see that a person might be homozygote for small a gene or small a allele. Uh, or homozygote for the capital A allele, or you can have a heterozygote. So you would have this pattern right here, 
Okay. If you have, if in that's in case you have a single gene that affects a single um, phenotype. Now, if you have two genes that affect a a, uh, a phenotype, you would have this pattern right here. Okay. That's the G genotype distribution. Okay. In case we have two loci or two genes. Now, if you have three loci, you would have a pattern that looks like this. That's the distribution of the genotypes. Okay? Now, if you have many loci that are associated with a phenotype, you would have something that looks like a bell shape or that's, that's normal distribution. And this is true for conditions such as height, weight, blood pressure, skin color, and so on. And, and this is known as continuous uh, variation or, uh, well, continuous variation. Okay, so you have involvement of other factors, including the environment. Well, let's look here at, at uh, uh, skin color, for example. You have uh, three genes that are responsible for skin color, and you have this distribution. So these individuals have very light skin, and these individuals have very dark skin right here. Okay, and you have uh, individuals in between. So again, that's normal distribution, sort of normal distribution. So you have a number of conditions or phenotypes that are associated with multifactorial inheritance uh, where you have involvement of both genes and uh, the environment. Um, and, and here's a list. These are con congenital factor or congenital disorders, including the cleft lip, uh, palate, uh, congenital uh, dislocation of the hip, and so on. Okay. And these are some acquired conditions. So in the congenital uh, conditions, uh, you have uh, uh, babies born with that condition. Acquired means that the person would develop the, these conditions later on in life. Uh, and that would include number of cardiovascular diseases, neurological diseases, autoimmune diseases, and so on, including diabetes uh, mellitus, okay? So uh, that's type, uh, type uh, uh, two uh, diabetes. Okay, now, well, you can read this as well. That is, you have uh, many genes are associated with uh, cleft lip or, and or palate, and uh, their expression are coupled with environmental factors. And these are the different factors that can be, uh, that are associated with the, uh, uh, the appearance of this condition. So these are some important points that we have to consider when we talk about multifactorial conditions. Uh, is that one of them is that they tend to run in families, okay? But the inheritance pattern is not as predictable as single gene disorder. So just like uh, the the inheritance of BRCA1, so having a a the mutated gene does not mean that the person would develop breast cancer or this person might develop something else, okay? So inheritance pattern is not really that clear. Except that what we're talking about here is that you have an increased risk of developing the condition. Now, the chance of recurrence is also less than the risk for single gene disorder. And that, that, again, that makes sense. Okay? Now, the idea here is that the closer the relationship, the higher the risk it is. So if you have, for example, a, a sibling that is affected by that condition, then there's a good risk, a good chance that the sibling of that affected individual would be affected as well if you compare that to a first cousin and the first cousin would have a higher chance of or a higher chance of developing this condition relative relative to a second cousin and so on now the other thing that is important is that the degree of risk or the extent of risk increases with increasing severity of that disorder so the idea here is that if you have an individual that has a severe case of any one of these conditions, then the sibling of that individual, brother or sister, would have an increased risk as well, okay? And the, the first cousin would have an increased risk as well, okay? And so on. And it can also be sex dependent, okay? And we'll talk about that in, in a bit more details. Now, the idea is that if you look at the genetics of individuals, um, the thing is that first degree relatives, that is parents, siblings, children of a certain individual, they all share half of the genes of that individual. So you share half of your genes with your parents, with one of your parents, okay? 
um, if you compare your genes to your brother or sister, then you share half of your genes as well. And same thing with your children. Now, if you look at uh, second degree relatives, that is uh, your uncles, aunts, uh, nephews, nieces, grandparents, grandchildren, half siblings, they all share one fourth of your gene. Now, third degree relatives like first cousin, great grandparents, great grandchildren, they share one eighth of your genes as well. Okay. Now, look at this table right here. Um, this is looking at a number of congenital uh, 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 malformations. And if you look at the cleft lip, for example, and or cleft palate, the incidence in the general population is one to a thousand. Okay. So the incidence is one to a thousand. Now, if you look at monozygotic twins, the risk increases by 400 times. That is, it becomes 4%. So instead of 0.1%, you have 4% risk of having this condition in a mono, in monozygotic twin, in both of these twins. Now, if you look at first degree relatives, the risk increases by only, um, by only, uh, by, by 40 times. So we're talking about 0.4%. Uh, and if you, can, if you look at second degree relatives, the risk increases by seven. If you look at third degree relatives, the risk increases by uh, three. Okay, same thing with the other conditions right here, like club foot, for example. Again, it's 0.1%, it's, uh, one to 1,000. The risk increases to 3% in monozygotic twins and so on. Okay, so notice also the increase in risk uh, is different among uh, different um, uh, conditions as well okay now the idea of inheritance of of multifactorial conditions can be exemplified in what is known as the threshold model so this is the inheritance continuous inheritance of a phenotype okay so it looks something like this a bell shape and the idea is that in order for individuals to have this phenotype, they have to have, or they have to have a number of factors. And these factors not only include genes, but they also include environmental factors as well. So there is what is known as a threshold. There is like a line that, that, that divides people with this condition versus people without the condition. So these are the affected individuals right here. So the idea is that if these individuals have a number of, of factors, then they have the condition, okay? And there's a threshold. Now, so we're talking about different factors. So let's say that in order to develop a certain condition, an individual must have, let's say, uh, eight different genetic variations and let's say two environmental factors, okay? Now, so if they have, if they have these eight genetic variants and they are also exposed to these two environmental factors, then these individuals would have the condition. Now, if they have only seven of these factors, like five plus two, five genetic variants uh, and, and two environmental factors, then they do not have these, con they do not develop these, these conditions and so on. So they can also have seven of these genetic variants plus three environmental factors. So that's a total of eight. So the idea is that the threshold here that we're talking about is actually eight, okay? So that threshold does not really uh, uh, change. Remember that. So you have to have, let's say, eight factors in order to develop a multifactorial condition or phenotype. Yeah. Okay, now, the idea is that uh, that's in the general population, okay? So we're talking about general population. Now, if you're talking about a smaller population, that is, if you talk about a family right here, and you look at this, again, you look at the, the, the same type of pattern inheritance, except, okay, except that this line, the bell curve right here, does not change. What changes is that it shifts a little to the right. Okay, so it shifts to the right the threshold stays the same. That is, they have to have eight factors 
in order to develop this condition. Now, what happens here is that when you have, when, when it shifts to the right, there is a higher proportion of affected individuals. Why? Because there's a good chance that they would collect these eight factors to develop that condition. Okay, you see, you see the, the, the point here? Okay, so there are certain considerations when it comes to a uh, threshold model. Is that risk is different than uh, that of Mendelian inheritance. We already established that. Uh, risk vary among different families. Again, it's a probability. So we're talking about the, these families and, and the total factors that they uh, might collect. So uh, uh, the number of factors can also be different or the inheritance, the, the combination of these factors can be different, okay? The probability of having, of collecting these factors can be different. So there's a good chance for one family to collect all eight factors versus another family that would have a lower chance of collecting these uh, uh, factors. The risk increases with close relatives, as uh, I said before, and uh, the differential risk to, of relatives decreases as the frequency of the disease increases in the general population. Okay, so the idea here, again, is that what happens is that there is in, in families, um, in families, the, the threshold model or the bell curve would shift to the right, uh, meaning that there is a higher degree of susceptibility to, to develop this multifactorial uh, disease. Okay, so the other thing is that is really important as well is that, again, the threshold is fixed. So you have to have eight factors for example, to, to develop this uh, condition. Now, the, the, the recurrence increases if, okay. So the idea here is that um, the, the average susceptibility uh, and the recurrence risk also increases with increasing number of previous affected children. So the idea here, again, if you have more people affected, then the bell curve would also shift to the uh, right, indicating that there is a good chance that individuals uh, within this family would, uh, uh, would share or would collect all of these uh, factors that are responsible for um, having this condition. Okay, so the risk increases uh, again. Uh, it's different than Mendelian inheritance. The risk increases among close relatives. We talked about that. The differential risk to relatives decreases as the frequency of the disease increases in the general population. And um, uh, so the, a lower threshold results in a smaller uh, difference, in other words. Now, the other thing that is important is that the risk increases with the severity of the malformation of a disease, as I said before. So if you have, um, uh, there's a 6% chance if, a, if a one of the parents uh, has bilateral cleft lip, versus 2% uh, if, um, if, if one parent has a unilateral cleft lip, okay? So the chance of having or developing a condition increases if the severity of that condition also increases uh, with the parents or even siblings. Okay, now, there is something that is important and, and that is, uh, and it, it's interesting as well, and that is the involvement of sex. So some conditions are uh, related to gender. The idea here, an, an example is uh, pyloric stenosis. Now, this condition right here affects males more than females. The ratio is five to one. So there's a good chance of, uh, there's five times uh, better or higher chance of a male being affected versus uh, females. Now, the idea here is the following, okay? Read this carefully. The idea here is that when the sex ratio deviates significantly from norm, offspring of affected probands of less 
frequently affected sex are at higher relative risk. What that means is the following. So for this pyloric stenosis, the idea is that it affects more males than females. So if the father is affected, okay, then um, there, there is higher chance that there is good chance that sons would be affected versus daughters. Okay, so we've established that. Now the idea is that if the mother is affected, now the idea here now is that the mother is a female, she has a she has less chance of having pyloric stenosis. But if she has pyloric stenosis, notice that the risk for males is 19.4 versus 7.3 uh, in females. So compare 19 to 5. Why is it that you have this increase from uh, 5 all the way to 19? The idea here is that in order for uh, a male to show this phenotype, let's say that they have to have uh, six factors um, collected. Okay, let's say four genes or, or genetic variants and two environmental factors. Okay, so in order for a female to be affected, she has to collect eight of these factors. So that's why they are less affected. So compare males to females. So males are affected, be, are more affected because they need six factors. They need less uh, factors uh, to develop that condition versus females. Females require eight. Okay. So the threshold. So the idea here is that the threshold is lower for males versus females. Now, if the mother is affected, it means that she has already these eight factors and that's why she's affected. So there is a really good chance that she would uh, uh, transmit these factors easily, six factors easily to her sons. And that's why there is a good chance that these sons would gather all of these six factors that can be, again, genes plus environmental factors. Now, the, the risk for daughters as well increases because now the mother has eight factors and, and daughters must have also eight factors. So it's easy now for daughters to collect all of these eight, eight factors if the mother is affected versus if the father is affected. Okay, so right here, the distribution of liability or that is the, 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 the factors um, if you have an affected boy, then you have, again, that's in a fam that's a general population. This is in a family right here. There is a shift of the belt curve to the right. So there is an increasing chance that uh, males would be affected. That's in blue. That's this region right here. And there's also a good chance of, um, of uh, females as well as males to be affected as well. Okay, compared to the, to the general population. But if you look at if the girl is affected, now there is further shift of the bell curve to the right. So it means that there is a good chance that males would be affected as well as females. Okay. Now there is uh, this term known as heritability that is, um, that is, what is the contribution of genetic factors to develop a multifactorial condition or phenotype? And this has been done, or this can be calculated using or in, in, in twin studies. So the idea here is that there, we, in twin studies, uh, we do a comparison of inheritance uh, of a certain phenotype uh, between monozygotic twins who share 100% of their genes versus dizygotic twins. So the idea here, if a trait is truly genetic, then monozygotic twins will have 100% concordance. That is, if one is affected, then the other one must be affected as well. That's compared to dizygotic twins who have lower concordance because they share 50% uh, of their uh, genes or genetic material. Now, if the trait is 100% environmental, then there should be no difference between monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. Okay, so that makes sense. 
Now let's look at these uh, phenotypes right here or conditions. So compare, so look at rickets right here. Rickets is related to deficiency of uh, vitamin D. So look at rickets right here. You compare monozygotic twins. This is concordance in blue, meaning that if one is affected, so if there's an 80% chance that if one is affected, then the other one is affected. Okay, so compare that to dizygotic twins, which is about 20% or 25%. So there is a good genetic, good genetic contribution in the development of rickets. Now look at measles right here. Measles in monozygotic twins, it's about 85%. If you look at uh, dizygotic twins, it's about 80% as well. So the idea here is that, yes, if one is affected, the other one is affected in monozygotic twins, but what is the genetic contribution? Really, it's, it's almost nothing. Why? Because if you look at dizygotic twins, it, the ratio is still the same. So there is hardly any contribution of genetics. And that makes sense because uh, if one is affected, the other one is affected because they live together very close to each other, so it's contagious. Same thing with dizygotic twins. Okay. Now, you look at alcohol drinking. If one is affected, the other one is affected. Like the, the concordance is 100%. Versus uh, dizygotic twins, it's about 80%. So, is there a genetic contribution? Yes, there is. But, because they live in the same environment, there is a good chance that if one is affected, the other one is affected as well, because of environment rather than genes. Look at criminality. Is there a genetic contribution? And it seems that there is, but again, it's not 100%, okay? Um, and so on. So you look at eye color. Is there a genetic contribution? Definitely. There is 90% chance if one has blue eyes, the other one would have blue eyes, okay? Why? They share the same genes, okay? And compare this to dizygotic twins, the, the concordance is lower. So, because they share, again, 50% of their genes. Now, I have a question for you. Why is it that you have this? Why is it that you have uh, some individuals, 5% of monozygotic twins, have different eye colors? So, you can answer this when we uh, meet uh, and discuss this uh, concept uh, further. So, how can we estimate uh, concordance and heritability? Concordance can be calculated by this equation. If both are affected uh, over the total number of affected twins, whether one is affected or the other one is affected, times 100. So that, the, that would give us concordance rate. Okay. Now, the thing is, again, uh, traits with a large genetic component will show higher concordance rate for monozygotic twins versus dizygotic twins. Okay. So we talked about that. Now, so the concordance ratio for mo is monozygotic twins over dizygotic twins. That would give us the, mono the, the concordance ratio. The higher it is, the more genetic a trait is. Okay? Now, how can we calculate heritability? Well, we can calculate by the, using this equation right here. So, heritability or H is equal to... 2 times uh, the ratio of, uh, of monozygotic twins minus ratio in dizygotic twins. The higher the number, the larger the, uh, the, the degree of heritability. So if you look at your textbook on page 146, uh, you can have, uh, there is heritability of uh, certain uh, conditions. All right, so here's a nice uh, statement that I'd like you to think about. So studies have found significant resemblance of per for percentage of teeth and surfaces restored or carious, having caries, within monozygotic but not dizygotic twins. Pairs, dizygotic twin pairs, sorry, reared apart and estimated the genetic contribution to caries as 40%. Okay, so that's the genetic contribution of caries. So think about this uh, statement. So here's a summary of um, uh, characteristics of multifactorial inheritance. 
although this order is familial, uh, there is no pattern that can be uh, predicted. Uh, the risk to first degree relatives uh, is approximately the square root of the population risk. That is, um, as uh, you know, as uh, uh, I, I showed before, if the risk is one to a thousand in the general population, then uh, in first degree relatives, it's the uh, square root of that, which is about uh, uh, one to thirty two. The risk is sharply lower for second degree than first degree relatives, but it, and it declines rapidly, uh, less rapidly for more repo, remote relatives. The recurrence rate is higher when more than one family member is affected. Also, the risk increases with uh, an increasing severity of the malformation. Uh, if a multifactorial trait is more frequent in one sex than in the other, then the risk is higher for relatives or patients of the less susceptible sex, as uh, I, I showed before with the pyloric stenosis, and increased recurrent risk when the parents are consanguineous uh, suggests that multiple factors with additive fa effects may be involved. Um, so, like environmental factors, for example. Okay, so uh, this is the end of this lecture. Uh, we will meet to uh, discuss uh, these issues in more details when you have time.